the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's the question the lawyer asks. Jesus. If you think it is the same question that Martin Luther asked, uh, what good must I do to inherit heaven, then you have misunderstood the scripture. It is not the same question at all, really. And maybe we'll get into that a little bit. But first, a quiz. Who is Billy Flynn? Anybody know Billy Flynn? How about Arnie Becker? Nobody? I'll make it a little easier. How about Dan Fielding? Be more specific. Lawyers. Does a young man who's falling asleep in the middle row know who Harvey Dent is? He's a lawyer from Batman. How about Frank, maybe, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but how about Atticus Finch? Doesn't it have something to do with a bird? How about Perry Mason? <laughs> yeah. Probably one of my favorites is uh, Matlock. Billy Flynn was the lawyer in Chicago. When they made the, the film of it, I believe he was played by Richard Gere, was he? Dan Fielding was Night Court. Arnie Becker, L.A. Law. You know the rest. The lawyer who stood up to test Jesus was well, not a legal expert like these characters, like Perry Mason, or, or like the real-life defense attorney, Alan Dershowitz. He was something closer to, well, what I am, closer to a pastor, although he might not have been ordained, Maybe he was a religion teacher or a seminary professor. Maybe, maybe something like that. Maybe he was more like Bill O'Reilly is with politics or Rush Limbaugh, kind of a pontificator, a, an expert of sorts, but an expert in the Bible, an expert in the law, the Torah, that is the law, God's law, the Jewish law handed down by God by angels, through the mediator. And who is the mediator? Moses. That's your epistle. The question the lawyer asked Jesus was a theological question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? But don't think that this was some kind of grown-up's version of Sunday school or, or even an academic debate between two ivory tower intellectuals hoping to get published in in next month's theological journal, no. In a culture that didn't know anything about the separation of church and state, it was, this was something closer to a, uh, a police interrogation. And the stakes were very high. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, today, in most circles outside of perhaps uh, fundamentalist uh, militant Islam, the answer to that question is not a life or death issue. In the world of Jesus and this lawyer who asked it, though, it was. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, you could say, uh, would eventually find a way to put Jesus to death for giving the wrong answer to questions like the one that this lawyer asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when we hear that question, it sounds a whole lot like uh, what we think of as a simply about a religious commitment. I guess that's a sad indictment of contemporary Christianity that we think so little of our religious commitments. Today, Christianity is just one aspect of our busy lives, it's, but it really should be the foundation that gives meaning to everything else. Most of our society still believes that people could use at least a little religion, but that in itself is part of the problem. Our society views religion as a side dish and not as the main course. Bible reading, sermons, prayers, Holy Communion, those are just extras that people fit in if they have the time. And oftentimes they don't. What question, what, what question?
question does a lawyer ask? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I don't know that any question could be more important than that. Nobody lives forever. Because of the fall of Adam and sins of our own, death comes for us all. The question is, well, then what? The story of the Bible is the creator's answer. God called the people, Israel, to lead the rest of the peoples of this world out of death and into a new life beyond death. God, God promised his children a world that was beyond injury and sickness and disease, a place where no one sinned and everyone worshiped God in spirit and in truth, a world without any pain or any suffering or any death. Now, countless recipients of that promise died, but they died in the faith of the creator of the universe, the God of Israel, that he had the power even to raise his people from the dead if that's what it would take to fulfill the promises he made to Abraham. I want you to notice in this that, that the grace of God is taken for granted entirely throughout. God did not call Abraham because of anything that he did. He called Abraham only by grace. Grace alone, Martin Luther would say. God made Israel his people out of a sheer act of mercy. He led them out of slavery in Egypt by an act of sheer mercy, by a series of miraculous plagues on the Egyptians and by the parting of the Red Sea. God didn't give Israel the promised land because of their righteousness, but rather for his own name's sake. He gave it to them because that is what he promised he would do for his people. The question was, who is part of God's people? And how can you tell? Or to put it another way, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It was the question that the lawyer put to Jesus. The lawyer's question was not, about what you must do to earn your way into heaven or what you can do to merit a place in God's kingdom on earth in the resurrection. God chose his people by grace, apart from any good works that they might have done. Heaven was a place of mercy and not merit. The resurrection was reserved for people who were redeemed by God, not by themselves. God's forgiveness was always at the heart of the election of his chosen people. That was the point of all those annual feasts and the sacrifices made in the temple. The people of God were a people simply because God made them a people. The question that the lawyer asked Jesus was not the question that Martin Luther asked. However valid that question was, the question the lawyer asked Jesus was about how you could tell right now in the present who God's people are. His question was about an inheritance. Nobody earns an inheritance. The lawyer knew that. You come into an inheritance, how? By belonging to a particular family. What must I do to inherit eternal life? How do you know who is in the family of God? That's another way of asking the question. The lawyer's question was about how you could tell someone was part of God's family. How could you tell that someone would, in fact, be part of God's chosen people in the age to come? There are a lot of people who claim to be part of God's family. The lawyer's question was, which group is right? How can you tell right now who will turn out to be right in the end? What markers demonstrate right here, right now, that a person will find a place in the kingdom of God and in the resurrection of the just? What must I do to inherit eternal life? It wasn't a question of good works versus grace. That was Luther's question, a valuable one. We thank God that he asked it and answered it. But that was not the lawyer's question in the gospel for today. His question was, what, Jesus, demonstrates in your eyes that I am truly part of God's family, that I will inherit the blessings promised to Abraham and to his children? That was the question that the lawyer asked of Jesus. It 
was a rather standard question with a standard answer, much like moves on a chessboard, at least the opening ones. If you move the center pawn, then the opponent knows exactly which pawn he must move. If you move out your knight first, don't do that, by the way, but if you do, then the opponent knows exactly which piece to move out then. And somebody who doesn't move out the correct piece shows that they just don't know much about the game. This question that the lawyer asked was standard, and it had a standard reply. So Jesus responded with a standard reply. What is written in the Torah? The law? How do you read it? This is an easy one, guys. No one's getting tripped up here. So the lawyer gives his standard reply. Well, you know what it says. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your strength and your mind. And uh, while you're at it, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love your neighbor. That's the chief summary of the whole Torah and the prophets to boot. By the way, it is the right answer. In case you wonder whether it is the right answer, hear what Jesus says. He says, let's look at it together. You have answered correctly. If you believe that the question the lawyer was asking is the question that Martin Luther was asking, you run into a whole lot of troubles with Lutheranism in this passage. It is not the same question. Jesus answers, you have answered correctly. It was the right answer back then. It's the right answer today. If you are truly part of God's people, you will keep the Torah, period. You will love God and you will love your neighbor. No one can change that back. No one. The word of the Lord endures forever. As God's people, we will love God and we will love our neighbor. Even Luther said that. So the lawyer then, wanting to justify himself, uh, asked Jesus another question. Who then is my neighbor? Now this, of course, was the lawyer's real question. It was the question that he fully expected to trip Jesus up. It was the question that had the life or the death consequences. Because if you have all these different groups claiming to be God's people, and you say, well, then who is really my neighbor? Jesus has to be very careful how he answers. Because if he points out the wrong group, they'll kill him. And they did. By narrowing the definition of neighbor to those who had the Torah, to those who had the law, those who were Jews, the lawyer wanted to demonstrate that he was, in fact, being faithful to the Torah, that he was truly part of God's people, that he was justified and would be justified in the future. In terms of his first question, the lawyer wanted to show that he would be one of those who would inherit eternal life. It says the lawyer wanted to justify himself, justify asking the first question, the lawyer believed that the Jews were God's people, and half-breed mutts like the Samaritans, and the full-blown pagans like the Romans, they certainly were not God's people. So it wasn't necessary to love them. It was not necessary. They didn't need to be treated like neighbors, because they weren't. They were outsiders. They were the unclean, the unwashed. They were enemies. And they should be treated accordingly. They had to be resisted. And when the opportunity arose, if need be, put to death. If you were a Jew and you didn't agree, well, you became an enemy too. And if you were popular enough to draw a following, like Jesus was, then you might just lead Israel astray. And that would mean you might have to be put to death, too. In reply, Jesus told a story, a story that we all know is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and along the way he was attacked. 
Our translation uh, in the bulletin says that he was attacked by thieves, but a more accurate translation would be by brigands or insurrectionists like those who were crucified with Jesus. Rome did not crucify thieves. Rome crucified terrorists and traitors. The man was attacked perhaps by Jews who believed that pagan outsiders were interlopers and had to be expelled from the land. They often resorted to terroristic violence to make their voice heard. Think of Barabbas. Many of the Pharisees and Torah experts, like the lawyer, were people just of this sort. Think Saul, who was later to be St. Paul. Maybe the man in the story was a Roman soldier. Jesus never says, the one on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jesus never says. But he continues the story. A priest came by and saw the man lying half dead in a ditch. But he passed by on the other side. And then a Levite came and did the same. But when a Samaritan came to the place where this man was, he saw him. He had compassion on him. He bound up his wounds. He set him on his own animal, and he gave him shelter. Turning to the lawyer then, Jesus finally asks a question of his own. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the brigands? And there was only one answer possible. The one who showed him mercy. So Jesus' command was also simple and the only reply possible. You go and do the same thing. And in that moment, Jesus fully answered the lawyer's original question and completely turned everything around on him. Here the question again. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Shouldn't I be protecting this promised land, the temple, and our ethnic purity by expelling the pagans even by force if necessary? Doesn't my revolutionary zeal show that I am truly one of God's children? Well, Jesus' story about the Good Samaritan is his reply. Samaritans and other pagans are actually entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. The priests, the Levites, the brigands, it is not possession of the Torah that shows someone is God's child. It is not even a job in the temple. It is faith in the God who loves all people and seeks the salvation of all nations that shows you are one of his children. And that would mean faith in me. I am the face of God's mercy to all, even to the pagans, Jesus would say. Truth be told, Jesus is the good Samaritan. He is the one who stops to bind up the wounds of the broken. He forgives our sins and restores us to God's family. He carries us not on just a beast of burden, but on his own shoulders, and he gives us rest. He promises us resurrection from the dead. Faith in Jesus is what marks out people as belonging to God's family. And that faith recognizes that Everyone is a neighbor. Doesn't this month mark a rather special anniversary? Anybody else know the other famous Martin Luther? King Jr.? Didn't he give a speech right around this time many, many years ago? What was the main thesis of his speech? That we would all be judged on the content of our character, not the color of our skin, not on our ethnic diversity, not on anything else except who we really are, that all people would come together as one. That happens in Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What demonstrates that I am indeed a child of God, forgiven of my sins, hope, hope in my heart for the world to come? The answer is faith in Jesus who showed mercy to you and to everyone else, even while we were as good as dead in our sins. It is faith in the forgiveness of our sins, won by Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross. Faith in that Christ 
faith, faith in the Christ who shows us that God is merciful to us. Merciful to us and to all. And that faith shows itself when you show that same mercy to others, no matter who they are, no matter what their race is, what their nationality is, what their background is, even if they buy, you know, Hondas. That faith shows itself when you forgive your enemies and you pray for those who persecute you. That faith shows itself when you bind up the wounds of the broken, just like Jesus did, and just like he still does for you every day. The lawyer's question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What shows that we are indeed part of the people of God? The short answer is that you are merciful, even as your Father in heaven has been merciful to you in Jesus' name.